Could you accidentally create a whole new mineral? Someone working at the Royal Museum of Natural History in Brussels did just that when they stored some calcium-rich rocks in an old oak cabinet. Over time, acetic acid vapors from the wood reacted with the specimens to form a silky white coating. A Belgian scientist identified this as a calcium acetate chloride pentahydrate he called calculocyte. It was recognized as a new mineral and entered into the International Mineral Association's official list. Turns out, it's just one of many entries on that list to be formed inadvertently due to human activity. A good example is aberrite, which was formed as the result of a shipwreck when pure tin ingots were corroded by seawater. Oxygen, hydrogen, and chlorine combined with the tin to produce transparent bladed crystals ranging from colorless to yellowish brown. These have been found in wrecks off the coasts of England, Norway, and Saudi Arabia. Many of these accidental minerals were an unintended result of mining. Andersonite formed on mine walls in sandstone-based uranium deposits when the dry air came in contact with evaporating water. This produced highly lustrous yellow rhombohedral crystals that glow under UV light. It's kind of pretty, though its jewelry potential is somewhat limited by its radioactivity. Eliite appears in bursts of bright purple needle-like crystals in slag, which is just a fancy name we use for what's left over after metal is separated from ores in an extreme heat process called smelting. My favorite, though, is probably tenunculite. This formed when hot gases from coal-burning mines in Russia reacted with the dung of the Eurasian kestrel. Yep. Heat and bird poop create these clusters of tiny crystals often shaped somewhat like a surgeon's knife. Hey, sometimes gemology is dirty work. They can be white, yellow, or even a soft lilac color. And there's a lot more where those came from. In fact, a recent survey found 208 of the roughly 5,200 minerals on IMA's list were created in the last 200 years, and at least in part due to human enterprise. That's 4%, which may not seem like a whole lot until you consider that it's been estimated the Earth has been forming minerals for billions of years. In comparison, that 4% happened in practically the blink of an eye. The ratio would be a lot higher too, except in 1998, the IMA got a lot stingier about what they allowed on their list, specifically barring future listings of minerals with any human origins. That may close the book on official recognition, but it doesn't change the fact that there are scads of new mineral-like substances out there that we've brought into existence. Strange new materials have been found in crusting old batteries and electrical components, in waste dumps, and geothermal piping systems. And the list could really grow monstrous if we consider new mineral-like substances we intentionally synthesize, like those in semiconductors, lasers, building materials, and even in ballpoint pens. This new mineral diversity has led some to advocate for a new epoch the Anthropocene. Did you know that we're currently living in the Holocene Epoch, which extends from the end of the last ice age? Since epochs are normally separated by significant changes in the rock layers to which they correspond, and since examination of our sediments millions of years from now would likely show crazy change in mineral presence and location, formal designation of our time as the Anthropocene Epoch was recommended to the International Geological Congress in 2016. Apparently, they're gonna take their time, let the idea sit there, and just see what happens. You know, because they're geologists. Anyway, all of that is way above my pay grade. Let's get back to the gems, shall we? While it will probably never make IMA's list, I think one of the most interesting new materials we've unintentionally created is trinitite. On the morning of July 16th, 1945, at the Trinity test site in Alamogordo, New Mexico, scientists first tested a plutonium-based nuclear bomb. The ensuing gas cloud lifted sand into the air and rained it down as molten droplets, fused at temperatures said to be 10,000 times hotter than the surface of the sun. The result was a crater that Time Magazine described as appearing like a lake of green jade, 2,400 feet in diameter. This weird green glass was chiefly made up of SiO2, or quartz, from the sand, along with a variable concentration of other elements and compounds. There was also a red variety thought to be colored by the copper in the wire that stretched from the ground to the bomb. Strangely enough, it actually became something of a hot jewelry item following the end of the war and was fashioned into earrings and hairpins. Supposedly worn to counter Japanese claims of lingering radioactivity from the bombs, this was one fad that was destined to end in disaster. But initially, collectors thronged to the Trinity site to pocket as many of the little green lopsided marbles as they could carry. 
Perhaps realizing this little souvenir wasn't quite as safe as they initially claimed, the army bulldozed the site in 1952, burying the remaining material underground. Still, the remaining particles are often dug up by ants excavating their tunnels and can be found concentrated around the tops of anthills. Though it is illegal for tourists to take anything from the site today, you can often find pieces from the initial rush for sale. But before you build your own collection, think carefully. It's described as slightly radioactive. That shouldn't be a big concern with our last material, though. I couldn't end a video on Anthropocene artifacts without mentioning Plastic Lomerate. Discovered on a Hawaiian beach in 2006 and officially named in a report from the Geological Society of America, Plastic Lomerate consists of plastic trash melted and fused with lava fragments as well as sand, shells, wood, and coral. While campfires are thought to be responsible for the original occurrence, it is speculated that similar deposits could be forming in various extreme temperature conditions around the globe. Due to its hardened plastic matrix, plastic agglomerate resists breakage far more effectively than sedimentary rocks, and its weight makes it resistant to being carried off by the wind or tides, so it is more likely to be buried, accumulating underground as a curious anthropogenic marker. Specimens have been featured in museums and even art galleries. Just goes to show that one man's trash is another man's... No, it's, it's still basically trash. That's all for today. Do you have anything in your closet that could be growing crystals? Let us know down in the comments. And while you're there, don't forget to like, subscribe, and of course, ring that bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching.